Hello and welcome. This is a talk on why the space shuttle looks so weird. And what do I mean by weird? Well, let's look at some history. These are the main rockets used for the Apollo program. Mercury, Gemini, Saturn 1B, Saturn 5. Rocket, 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 rocket. They all look very similar. What about other examples of rockets that carry humans? Soyuz, Falcon 9, Atlas V, sometime soon maybe, and Long March. Rocket, 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 rocket. They all look like rockets. But then we have the shuttle. Is that a rocket? It doesn't look like a rocket. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about kind of the design process and some of the compromises that led to shuttle looking the way it did uh, rather than looking like a more conventional vehicle. And to do this, we have to rewind way back to 1969, kind of the, the high point of the Apollo program, or maybe a little past the high point. And at that point, there was what was called the Space Transportation System. And this really involved these, this very big overall goal. And this was NASA's kind of all-you-can-eat sort of thing. If we had the same sort of budgets that we had during Apollo, what would we do with them? And you can see it's really, really uh, ambitious. So in low Earth orbit, we have a space station. Um, and then we have a space shuttle. This is where I think the first term, first time the term comes up. Um, then we have a nuclear shuttle, and the nuclear shuttle can be used to take you all the way to Mars. Even maybe having a Mars base and a Mars uh, space base or Mars orbital base. Then additional, there was a lunar base, lunar orbit station, a geosynchronous orbit station, a big space base in Earth orbit, and then a low Earth orbit space station. So all of these big plans. And here's some nice concept art. On the right, you see we have a space base. Um, I think this is supposed to have rotational gravity. That's why the Habs are out at the side. Um, this doesn't look really at all like what ISS looks like, but that's kind of conceptually what they were thinking about. And then on the left, we see uh, the tug which is labeled two and three, I think. I think four is the nuclear version. And then finally at the bottom, we have the space shuttle. Looking vaguely like the space shuttle actually ended up. But then we have to talk about budgets. And I picked a few points along the, Na the NASA budget time to make some points. And 1966 was really the high point of budget um, in terms of Apollo. And they spent about $6 billion um, in 1966 dollars. That dropped to $4 billion in 1970, um, three point something in 1975, and then back up to about five in 1980 when shuttles started flying. And that looks like a pretty flat budget. But if you didn't live, live through those years, you might not remember that those were years of high inflation. And to look at buying power, we want to convert these back to 2021 dollars. So if we do that, we see a very, very different picture. Um, we see that in 1966, NASA spent the equivalent of $50 billion per year. Um, we a lot of money. And uh, just a few years later, four years later, that was down to 28. So from the high point of spending on Apollo to just a few years later, they nearly cut the budget in half. And then down 1975, it's even lower in real dollars. 1980, it's real, even lower in real dollars. And this change from kind of the Apollo world where uh, lots of money was spent to this new world where NASA really had to compete for money um, was a big change. And it's a little strange to those of us who have watched like the last 20 years. So the last 20 years, NASA has a typical budget allocation. 
and it moves up a little bit or it moves down a little bit. But NASA is one of those agencies that has been around forever now, and it's just kind of assumed it will get a part of the, a part of the federal budget. And that very much wasn't true after Apollo. So what happened? So going from the equivalent of 50 billion down to 28, something had to give. And first, the Mars base went away. So if you don't have the Mars base, you don't need the nuclear shuttle anymore. So that goes away. The lunar base, well, you can't really afford that. So that goes away along with the synchronous station and the big space base. And you don't need the tug anymore. So what does that leave you with? That leaves you with your low Earth orbit space station and the space shuttle. And this approach, uh, this kind of scaling back to only doing things in low Earth orbit, was often referred to as shuttle and station. Now, NASA actually did do a station. So one of the remaining Saturn V's uh, a third stage was converted to Skylab and Saturn V was launched. And then there were three missions done with Saturn 1Bs. And NASA kind of started down this path. And the goal was that shuttle would be up and flying quickly enough so that you could save Skylab. And unfortunately, in this case, NASA put all of their eggs in one basket. And a combination of shuttle delays and kind of unusual sunspot activity that meant the orbit of Skylab decayed more quickly. Those together meant that shuttle was too late to save Skylab. And now that put NASA in kind of an interesting place. If you want to do shuttle plus station and you have budget issues, um, if you just do station by itself, it doesn't buy you anything because what would you do with a station? Um, you can do shuttle by itself if you kind of change its focus to be uh, more of a payload launcher and less of just a shuttle for people. Now, as I said, uh, the idea that NASA got a big budget was something that wasn't very common. Um, and in fact, in the 1960s, if you wanted to do a new project like shuttle, you had to convince people to do it based on an economic argument. Now, NASA was looking to use the Titan III for most of their launches. So if you want to do shuttle, you have to make a convincing argument that it's going to be cheaper than Titan III. Um, this seems very alien if you look at the last 20 or even 30 years of how NASA has looked at budgets. Um, they really have not looked at economics this way, but this was one of the requirements. And so what NASA did is they commissioned a study that looked at the next 15 years of flying and looked at the cost for different flight rates. And what you can see is that uh, the Titan looks like it's considerably more expensive. So it looks like, well, this looks like shuttle, you know, uh, you'll spend money up front on shuttle, obviously, but over the 15 years, it will turn out to be a very good thing to have built shuttle. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the sort of comparison that flew. Remember I said there was high inflation. And because there's inflation, that means the dollars that you spend in this year um, are essentially worth more than the dollars you might spend 5 or 10 or 15 years out. So what it means is a program like shuttle that has a big investment up front um, really doesn't look as nice. And here's a different chart that essentially shows the same data, but for different inflation rates. And what you see is that, well, two things. If you have 10% inflation, um, it really doesn't look like shuttle is going to work out at all. It never ends up being cheaper than Titan III. If you assume 5% inflation, um, there's kind of a break even at 40 flights per year, and then there is uh, a benefit going beyond that. And the curve looks a little weird. Uh, the numbers they did put uh, DOD flights and NASA flights together, and they have different costs and, and different requirements. So that's why the curve has this 
this weird kink in it. So this set the stage for a shuttle needing to fly a lot. And uh, NASA really needing to make that argument that, hey, we are going to fly all the time. And if you look at that, hey, 55 times a year, that is more than once every week. Um, which in retrospect seems a little uh, overly optimistic, I guess. So, the goal at the beginning for shuttle was to have a fully reusable shuttle. And this idea had been around for a long time. And I have some fun different designs. Uh, some of these were done pre-shuttle. Some of these were done as part of early shuttle design. Um, here we see a pretty typical uh, two-stage vehicle. We have a winged booster, uh, the big one. Then we have a smaller winged shuttle on top of it. And uh, kind of interestingly, it has these little jet engines that can flip out. So not only can you come back, you can light up your jet engines and kind of fly a little bit back to land. Um, here's another concept, um, very similar. This one is a straight wing rather than a delta wing. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, here's another fun one. Uh, this looks more like a conventional shuttle, uh, but you know we have a big winged shuttle uh, and uh, a big winged carrier. And here's one of my personal favorites. Wow, that is a big vehicle. And so a very big carrier vehicle and a very big shuttle. And you notice cockpits look very airline-like. Um, so you can think of this as, as space plane very much. And then one of my personal favorites, uh, this is called a triamese design. This, this has essentially three very similar vehicles. Um, the two on the outside, on the left and right, are the boosters. And then the center one is the orbiter. And the idea here is you build three vehicles and they'll all be pretty similar. They'll be a lot cheaper because of that. Um, also notice that these have retractable wings. So on takeoff, you have the wings uh, pivoted into the body. And then once you get to a place where you need it, um, you can pivot them out. So those are some of the ideas. And now to get a bit into the design challenges. And the first one is tank size. You remember that very big uh, orbiter and very big carrier? Uh, NASA had committed up front that they were going to build an engine that ran on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, um, otherwise known as Hydrolox. And that is, in fact, the engine that ended up becoming um, the RS-25 Space Shuttle main engine. Uh, Hydrolox is really great from a performance perspective. It has a very high ISP. Unfortunately, hydrogen is not dense at all. And what that means is it requires large and heavy tanks. Here's a little comparison that I thought would be kind of interesting that illustrates it. So on the left, we have Delta IV Heavy. Delta IV Heavy um, is Hydrolox. Um, on the right, we have Falcon Heavy. And that uses RP-1 fuel and liquid oxygen, um, sometimes known as Carolox. So if we look at that, we can see that Delta IV Heavy is considerably bigger. Um, each of those stages at the bottom, each of the boosters is about five meters across, and the Falcon Heavy ones are 3.7 meters. So much beefier rocket. But if we look at payloads, well, what do we see? Um, Delta IV Heavy payload, about 29 tons to low Earth orbit. Falcon Heavy, theoretically, 63 tons to low Earth orbit. So what we see is the that when we're doing hydrogen-based designs, inherently, we end up with bigger tanks. So big tanks, when we're doing this fully reusable shuttle, means a large shuttle. And unfortunately, that's really problematic for a shuttle-type vehicle because that big tank needs to be shielded during re-entry. Now, you can argue for a vehicle like the Delta IV Heavy, um, you have bigger tanks, but you get higher performance, and that's maybe a trade-off you want to make. 
For the shuttle, the problem is you get that performance benefit coming up, but all of your thermal protection has to now shield this larger tank. And that means not only is your tank heavier, but your thermal protection system is much heavier. And that ended up being quite problematic uh, for shuttle. So what did they end up doing? Well, Grumman Aerospace came up with this really interesting concept. And I should say, you can go back there. There are countless different concepts um, for how you might do uh, the, the reusable shuttle. And they came up with this interesting concept. And basically they said, hey, we know the hydrogen tanks are gonna be really big. It's gonna be really hard to design an orbiter um, if we put the hydrogen tanks inside. Why don't we just put hydrogen tanks on the outside? So this is very much like drop tanks that you would use on a jet aircraft to extend your range. So they came up with this and NASA said, hey, that's a really interesting concept. Why don't you run with it a little bit? And that led to a number of different designs. So here's a, uh, another design. This looks more like uh, what shuttle turned out to be. You can see it has the front half of the orbiter has liquid oxygen and then the liquid hydrogen is in an external tank. And here we have a first stage that's actually a solid rocket booster. Now, once they did this, they took the obvious next step. And here's the obvious next step. Well, if we're gonna put the liquid hydrogen in an external tank, why don't we put the liquid oxygen in the external tank as well? That shrinks the orbiter down farther um, for a given amount of payload. And you can see this design um, is starting to look very, very much like the actual orbiter. And uh, interesting, you notice this has a recoverable booster. This booster actually has air breathing engines in it. And uh, that was fairly common for the booster designs as well. So NASA looked at this and their estimate was that this was going to be about a billion and a half dollars cheaper to develop. And that's a big deal. Um, Initial prices, like on the, the re reusable, the fully reusable one, was somewhere 9 billion, 12 billion. Um, and that seemed like a uh, amount of money NASA could probably not get. So anything they could do would uh, to, to save this kind of money was a big deal. And uh, they're getting a system that's mostly reusable. We can reuse the orbiter, we can reuse the booster and we have this relatively small external tank. So uh, we'll toss that away, but that seems like a reasonable trade-off to save this much in development cost. So the next question that comes up is how many vehicles? And this is really around whether you are going to try to recover the booster or not. So here we have another concept on the left. You notice it has now has an external tank for the orbiter and then it has a winged uh, booster. Um, in this case, they were gonna power it with the F1 engine, which is the engine used on the first stage of the Saturn V. So we see two vehicles on the left, and we see two different options for one vehicle plus a some sort of booster. So um, if you look at this, which one of these is gonna be more expensive? Well really obvious building two vehicles that can go up and fly back is much more expensive than just building one. So this is another area where cost really pushed them in a specific direction. So we ended up with one vehicle plus booster. Um, the next question is how you do staging. And there are two terms here. There's parallel staging or parallel burn and series staging or series burn. And in parallel burn, you light the booster engines and the orbiter engines at the same time. So this is what Space Shuttle ended up doing. Um, in series burn, you light the booster engines and then when they run out, you light the orbiter engines. So uh, parallel is sometimes called stage and a half, where the, the boosters are half of a stage rather than a full stage. Um, series is just the conventional way of doing that. So what are the trade-offs? Well, parallel, you end up needing a larger tank. And if you look at these pictures, you can see the tank on the left. 
is a little bit bigger. And that's because you run the orbiter engines the full time. So a little bigger tank, probably not a big deal. Um, in the series burn, you have a smaller tank and you also have just a smaller second stage in general, just because it doesn't need to be as capable. It doesn't need to run the full time. Uh, parallel, you need a smaller booster because you have the thrust of the orbiter. Um, it's not a big difference. If you look at shuttle, um, at takeoff, the vast majority of the thrust comes from the boosters rather than the orbiter. But it makes a little difference. One thing that looks like uh, a significant issue is when you're running parallel, your orbiter needs to have engines that can run at sea level and run all the way to vacuum. Now, normally what you do with a series burn is you would use different engines or at least different engine nozzles. So for the sea level, you need relatively small engine nozzles. But when you get up into vacuum for the second stage, you want to use big vacuum nozzles. And that can give you a significant increase in fuel efficiency. And this can be a big deal. But it turns out in this case, so if we look at this picture in the back of shuttle, and those are engines that run at sea level. And there actually isn't really any room there in this design to go with bigger nozzles. So just from a physical packaging perspective, um, this turns out to be a theoretical difference, but not an actual difference. Even if you went with series staging, you can't fit the more efficient vacuum engines on here. So what it ends up is that the smaller booster that you would use in parallel is simpler and cheaper to develop than the boosters you would use for series. And that's really the big trade-off that matters. And you end up with a larger tank, but you're already building this tank anyway. Making it a little bigger does not really affect your development costs very much. So once again, NASA is going to make a choice here to do the thing that's cheaper. And then the finally quest, final question is, what kind of boosters are you going to run? Are they going to be solid fueled or are they going to be liquid fueled? And both of these were candidates for the space shuttle. So solid rockets, uh, just because of the propellant they use, they are not terribly efficient. They have a lot of thrust, but in terms of their ISP, kind of their fuel economy, they are not great. Um, liquid ones, you can run relatively higher performance engines. You get more ISP. Although this design, they were using a design called pressure fed. So this, these engines don't have turbo pumps. They're really cheap um, and they're kind of efficient, better than solids, but they aren't really high efficient. The solid rocket motors or the, the whole booster is made out of these thick steel casings. So you essentially have the casing and then the propellant grain inside um, starts as a liquid and is poured in and it hardens. And that's pretty much how they make. Um, the liquid one has thin tanks. Now being pressure fed, they're a little beefier than most rockets would be, but they're still kind of thin. Um, the solid ones, cheap to build. The liquid ones, well, we have these individual tanks and then we have to have pressurization and then we have to have different propellant lines um, and all of that structure and we need to have the engines. So it's definitely a more expensive approach. And that clearly drove NASA in one direction. But I think the thing that really pushed them towards the solids is they felt pretty confident that the solids could be recovered. So they would come back under parachute and you're just dropping this thick steel rocket into the ocean. Um, the liquid ones, uh, who knows? These are pretty big rockets and maybe they'd be okay and maybe they wouldn't be. Um, it might depend upon what sort of sea conditions you had. And NASA wanted to fly all the time. So they don't want to have to wait until the sea gets calm so that they don't break up uh, their booster when it lands. 
Um, further, the solids are just really this empty tube. So uh, can you dunk them in seawater? Absolutely. Um, they just fill up and all you have at the end is the, the steel casing with some propellant residue. So it's, it's really easy. You take it back, you clean that out, and then it gets recast again. Um, so it's a straightforward operation. Um, it turned out for shuttle it didn't really save any money, but it's something you know you can do. Um, for liquid, you have a lot of sophisticated stuff here, and there's a big concern that the seawater is going to get into your engines and actually ruin them. And that's a real concern. Um, there was even a design for pressure-fed liquid boosters that had a clamshell that kind of closed and sealed off uh, the engine end. And the idea was you could do that and then you would keep the seawater out. Uh, that seems like a, a hard engineering problem to make it work. So based on all of this, NASA just decided to do solids. Um, they're easy to design, liquid's a lot more design work. Um, solid ended up being conservative, and once again, it ended up being cheaper from a development perspective. And remember, NASA is really, really, really working hard to keep the development cheap. Now there's one more fun uh, design consideration, and this has to do with cross range. And to get shuttle funded, NASA needed to work with the Air Force. And the Air Force had this very specific requirement that they wanted out of shuttle. So here we see a picture, and there's a little dot right at the south end of California, and that's Vandenberg Air Force Base. And this is the really the prime US launch location for going into polar orbit, which is what you'd want to do for many reconnaissance satellites. So you launch due south out of Vandenberg. And the Air Force wanted to do something that was very aggressive. They wanted to do what, uh, what is called a single orbit mission. So you would launch, you would get into space, you would open up the payload bay doors, you would uh, deploy the satellite immediately, close the doors, and then re-enter on the same orbit. So that basically gives you 90 minutes uh, from the time you launch to the time that you are re-entering, uh, something of that order. And they wanted to do that because they were worried that if you ended up in a war situation that people would try to shoot down the shuttle. And if you have to wait uh, for the Earth to rotate all around uh, long enough, that's quite a delay. So, we're in Vandenberg, we launched due south with a shuttle. And then we've gone around the other side, and then we're going to come back and we're going to try to land. But 90 minutes later, the Earth has rotated around. And it has rotated enough that this point where we launched from, that we're kind of aiming at on our orbit, is now in the middle of the Pacific. And that doesn't work very well for recovery. So, to be able to do this scenario, uh, the Air Force required what's called a cross-range requirement. And basically that means you can fly this curved re-entry path, that you have enough lift and enough wing on the vehicle so that you can get back to the launch site in a single orbit. And this drove shuttle design, not surprisingly. So you can see on the left, um, you notice some of the earlier designs that I showed had these short wings, um, and some of the other designs had delta wings. And the big difference between those is the short wings or low cross range you need a lot of cross range, you need a lot of wing on your vehicle. Now, wings are big, heavy, expensive. And if you're doing a lot of cross range, there's a lot of aerodynamic force. So it makes your whole vehicle heavier. But they chose high cross range. And why did they? Well, remember, they had to make the argument that they could fly shuttle a lot 
it was going to be cheaper than the Titan III. And to do that, they had to have Air Force agreement to fly Air Force uh, payloads. And Air Force wanted this. Now, it turns out, uh, though the Air Force spent somewhere on the order of $4 billion uh, getting Vandenberg ready to do shuttle launches, um, shuttle never launched out of Vandenberg. And it, it turned out fairly early, um, it became obvious that uh, shuttle was not going to launch at the rate they had hoped, and that the Air Force was going to need to explore different alternatives, at least for most of their payloads. So, what's the summary? Well, the big summary is the shuttle design was driven primarily by monetary concerns. Uh, both in the initial design and then later when they started doing development. Uh, there simply was not enough money available. Uh, Nixon ended up allocating about $5 billion uh, to do all of the shuttle development. And NASA essentially had to build shuttle on the cheap. And that is why they ended up with this design. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to understand this process in a lot more detail, there's this wonderful book called The Space Shuttle Decision that goes through a whole bunch of the concepts and how they made choices and what happened at the political level. Um, you can obviously buy this online. It's also available uh, freely as a PDF online if you'd just rather do that. Um, another reference, if you're interested in uh, both the kind of design concepts and how they actually implemented them in shuttle. Um, there's this wonderful course that comes out of MIT called Engineering the Space Shuttle. And you can find that on edX.org. Um, it's currently, you can just see the archive, which means you can't actually get credit for it. But they brought in a number of the engineers that actually worked on the shuttle. And this is, if you are interested in this sort of thing, it's just absolutely fascinating to look at uh, the trade-offs that they made along the way. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks. And if you like the content, please subscribe.